Victoria 3, The Standard of Living is a very interesting dev diary about, well, the standard of living, what happens when it rises, what do you need to fulfill when it rises, uh, the different pops that have different standards of living, what these consist of, and what are the consequences of higher and lower standards of living. There's a lot in here. It's basically a sociologist's uh, wet dream. Let's get into this. <laughs> Standard of living affects two major aspects of the game, birth and death rate and pop loyalty. And all pops in Victoria 3 have a standard of living score between 1 and 99, which represents by a perfectly scientific and objective metric <laughs> precisely how great their life is. Pops with levels 1 to 4 are labeled starving. Levels 5 to 9 are, 9 are struggling, and so on. Through impoverished, middling, secure, prosperous, affluent, wealthy, lavish, and at level 60 plus opulent. We don't really expect a lot of pops to reach level 60 plus, but knowing you, they've left plenty of headroom to accommodate the mad economic experiments. So, <laughs> back to that. Birth and death rate and pop loyalty. So that's what it affects. Birth rate is simply the percentage of children born to pops each year, while death rate is the percentage of pops who die. Both values start out high and decline with increased standard of living, but birth rate declines slower than death rate, leading to a net increase in population growth with increasing standard of living. The system models that increasing standard of living tends to lead longer to, to longer life expectancy, but declining natality birth rate. Each perimeter can be modified independently by a variety of effects, so it's all moddable too. And as you can see here, there are ways to influence things like birth rate. In that case, scratch your priesthood's back. They'll scratch yours. Note that interest group traits can vary between interest group variants, so a different religion might provide a different benefit. So be fruitful and multiply. Uh, that's a Christian doctrine. Plus 5% birth rate. Since this interest group is powerful, their interest group traits have a 100% stronger effect. So. It would be like 10% or something like that. Approval if devout is at least loyal, devout not marginalized. So there is that. The common people, <laughs> the most important values to instill are those of building a family and caring for children. Be fruitful and multiply. So that will increase your birth rate. A side effect to emancipation, but while reduced population growth here initially appears to be a penalty, increasing the proportion of industrial workforce at the same time with rights of women tends to lead to increasing standard of living, which provides a net increase in population growth. Even. So that is a constitutional law, as you can see here, not a trait from the interest group. It's for now not part of the constitutional laws in this state. It increases the workforce ratio by 10% and decreases the birth rate by 5%. Requires one of the following feminism, <laughs> which they don't have here. Pops in the East India Company will recalculate their interest group support when this is enacted. So a lot of that changes things, but the workforce ratio and the birth rate influence and are influenced by the standard of living. Pop loyalty is altered whenever their standard of living increases or declines from its current value. And uh, next week there will be a <laughs> there will be a dev diary on this even more detailed political movements. So if your pops are starving, you will have political movements, is what that means, because they probably hate you then. A pop's wealth attribute forms the foundation for its standard of living. Pops can also gain more intangible boosts or penalties to their standard of living from any number of sources. Pops accumulate wealth over time while their weekly income exceeds their weekly expenses. Conversely, if a pop's expenses exceed its income, wealth will decline. How large their expenses are depends on what and how much they consume which is also dependent on their wealth. What this means is that as long as a pop's income remains the same, and the cost of the goods and services in their state and market remains the same, that pop's wealth will over time drift towards exactly the level of consumption they can afford to sustain. 
Cause as wealth changes, the consumption also changes, which affects the prices of the goods in the market, which might in turn affect their wages and dividends, etc. They might need more of that, because the goods in the market cost more and so on. I mean, everybody of us has probably experiences to that. Just move to another state or wherever, and then prices are totally different. Or moved from a big city to a, to a rather uh, agricultural region, and you'll see that you usually have to pay a lot less for things. Depending where you go shopping, of course. This weekly shortfall of funds will eventually lead to a reduction in wealth and thereby consumption. Here's an example. But since the shortfall is only a small fraction of this income in that case, it will take several months to have an impact on the wealth score and thereby the standard of living. So we have the net income here. You can see 4.51k. Subsistence output is 2.82k. Dependent wages are 1.1k and wages are 592. So the weekly expenses in turn are 4.64k. Land taxes and composed of land taxes and needs. So the net income is they're, they're losing money. Progress towards next wealth level is 0% because of course losing money. Annual income per working adult in that region is 3.02. Wealth has a number of functions in addition to forming the basis for standard of living and raw, pop, pops raw political strength, excluding any such power conferred by the country's voting franchise, which is traded separately, is dependent on their wealth. So if you have wealth, you have political strength, you have influence. Some privately operated institutions provide benefits to pops only in relation to their wealth. Many professional qualifications also require pops to have a certain amount of wealth. Each wealth level is defined by a set of needs and an amount of value that needs to be spent on goods to fulfill that need. This value is defined in goods-based prices such that the need for standard clothing for a pop of size 10,000 with wealth level 14 might be fulfilled by buying 87 pounds worth of clothes, assuming perfectly balanced supply and demand. The actual price of clothes where the pop lives is over-demanded the cost to fulfill this need will also be higher. Market economics, free market. As a result, cheaper goods means wealthier and happier pops. This is an example. This peasant pop's wealth is low. It's at six, so it's barely above starving. It's at struggling, so it consumes only the basic necessities. Needs is mostly basic food, 2.21k, 727, simple clothing, 496, heating, 410, basic items, and 340, intoxicants. Some beer or something like that. Many needs can be satisfied by a variety of different goods, because you might have the choice between beer and cigarettes, right? Or something like that, at the pop peasant pop's wealth. For example, the need for heating requires wood, fabric, coal, oil, and or electricity. These can be purchased in any combination, assuming the total base prices add up to the required value. When given this option, POPs will attempt to make a rational purchase decision based on which goods are the most available, satisfying their need with some mix of these goods or even only one, if that's the only one available. In this way, an in London isolated state might not consume any fish at all as long as it has sufficient grain, fruit, meat or even packaged groceries to satisfy their need for food. They have a choice. It's not fixed like in Anno, for example. It is a dynamic system that satisfies the needs based on the categories the goods fall in. Like you might have some, some goods in basic food, and they'll show that later. And if you have a selection of these combined to that value of 2.2k, then that need for basic food is fulfilled. As you can see here, there's an example, a breakdown of how the peasants in Ceylon spent their heating budget this week. Current heating expenses 235k Tamil peasants in Ceylon fabric. Uh, 10? 51.4 of the amount so it's mostly heated with fabric and 280 uh, three, uh, 38 pounds are the cost for the fabric then there's wood 
that's 35% of it. And it's 34% of the cost. So they, as you can see here, they are choosing, they're preferring stuff that is rather low cost compared. And they don't want to take coal and oil, but they will take it if they have no other choice. As you can see, coal is 12% of the amount, but 16% of the cost. And oil is 0.7% of the amount, but 1% of the cost. So it's highly priced. Whereas wood and fabric have relatively low prices. Total cost of 496. So goods can also appear in several different needs categories. Groceries, meat and fruit can fulfill the need for both basic food and luxury food. But grain or fish can only fulfill the need for basic food. As a result, maintaining only millet farms and fishing wharfs to meet your food needs will mostly satisfy your poor pops while focusing on livestock ranches and banana plantations will cause wealthy pops to inflate the price of the available food supply and further impoverish the poor. Operating productive food industries that can turn grain and fish into groceries is good for everyone in your country and frees up available supply of meat and fruit to be consumed by those with a need for luxury food. There's an example here. A breakdown of who requires basic food and how it can be fulfilled. Basic food overview consumed by pops of wealth level 29 and below. Level 29 is, is not that bad anymore. It's not struggling. So what are the needs for basic food for them? Consists of the following goods mutually substituable through goods substitution. So it's only the basic food part. Grain, fish, meat, fruit and groceries. And fish is equivalent to grain and meat is uh, you only you, you need a little bit less meat um, to replace the grain so if you want to um, replace the grain with meat that would be you, you would need less meat you would also need less uh, fruit or you need less groceries but if you if you want to replace the groceries or the fruit or the meat uh, with grain you need 1.5 units of grain for that so you can fulfill the basic food needs with grain only, but it will be a little bit more costly. Lower wealth levels have only a handful of needs, such as simple clothing, heating, basic food and intoxicants. The middle levels introduce more refined needs like household items, services, luxury drinks and free movement. Really wealthy pops consume increasingly vast quantities of luxury goods to impress and outdo their peers. In some cases, needs disappear entirely in favor of more diverse needs. The need for simple clothing which can be satisfied by both fabric and clothes will, as a pop is raised from abject poverty, be gradually phased out by the need for standard clothing, which include only professionally sewn items. Compared to the wealth six peasants, these wealth 17 bureaucrats are more diverse in their requirements. Like as you might know from Anno, you have really a couple of needs that you have to meet for these people. So they will, so they will be loyal to you. They will be happy. And that is like where it stops with uh, the basic needs are basic foods, uh, standard clothing, intoxicants and heating or something like that. But these have, yeah, they, they even have standard clothing, not even simple clothing. So it's improved. They have still basic food, but they're also services, standard clothing, household items, intoxicants, free movement, heating, luxury items and also luxury drinks. And as a sum, they just need more, I think. And it's also an, another kind of pop. Then, if you introduce new goods into your market, it will this will help you diversify your economy and alleviate the, de the demand on crucial industrial goods. Importing oil, either petroleum from newly discovered deposits or whale oil from the few places in the world that produce it, will cause your pops to buy some quantity of it for heating instead of coal or electricity, which lowers the price of those goods and help make your industries more profitable. Introducing opium into your market will decrease the pop demand for liquor and tobacco, tobacco for good or ill. Some goods are favored over others by default if available. Once electricity is available to them, Due to its convenience, pops will prefer to buy it over wood or coal, even if they're the same price. 
Some goods can be replaced by other goods entirely, while others will always be required to some bare minimum. Train travel can completely replace the need for having your own automobile to drive around in, but having an automobile doesn't ever completely remove the need for an occasional train ride to see your cousin who lives all the way in Paris. And in addition to these factors, cultures can develop obsessions for certain goods. And some even have taboos they must abide by, so the goods they cannot use. A country can also encourage or discourage the consumption of certain goods using authority, perhaps an effort to avoid enriching a hated enemy or entice pops to buy something that's heavily taxed over something that is not. This impacts the purchase habits of POPs affected, despite this being irrational from a strictly financial perspective. So what is an example for that? What if the Bengali were obsessed with the status afforded to them by luxury furniture? This could happen due to events or organically, because luxury furniture is a really prevalent luxury good in markets, but a lot of Bengali POPs live in that case. But even in this, if this habit is developed around their homelands, Bengali pops that migrate abroad to the USA or Australia or Japan will continue preferring luxury furniture to other luxury goods and will suffer financially if the same level of access is not available there. Here you have the example. So that's turmoil 1% and the obsession is luxury furniture. Taboos are liquor and wine. But the Bengali culture is discriminated in America in that case. It's East in, in no in the East India Company. So as you can see here, they they cannot drink liquor or wine, but they want luxury furniture, luxury furniture. They go taking it to the streets. They want luxury furniture. Yeah, scrap that shitty IKEA. <laughs> Let's close out. Um, by considering the difference between this and the consumption model from previous games. So Victoria 2, pops have different life every day and luxury needs based on their type. What they call the profession Victoria 3. Both in types of goods and quantities, pops in Victoria 2 always strive to get promoted into types which require more advanced and luxurious goods in larger quantities, but will fail to do so if they cannot afford it, since certain advanced types of pops in Victoria 2 perform their duties objectively better than their less advanced counterparts, for example craftsmen or clerks, it becomes important to retain access to advanced goods in order to ensure that your workforce is internationally competitive. But in Victoria 3 this formula is, formula is turned on its head. An engineer is not intrinsically better than a machinist who is not intrinsically better than a laborer. There's no ideal national proportions between them you need to maintain in order to maximize the competitiveness. Different professions do fulfill different functions, but it's the production methods of the buildings they work in that determine what function they serve. By choosing what buildings to construct and which production methods to activate, you create the opportunities for these professions, which in turn impose changes to the population. What types of goods you need to ensure access in order to keep the population satisfied is not driven directly by what professional opportunities you have created, but rather by what wealth development and wealth distribution these changes have resulted in. And we have here an example here. Professions that are part of the middle strata in this state are considerably better off than those in the lower strata, and not far off from the upper strata. It's very likely this state hasn't started industrializing yet, since shopkeepers who run the pre-industrial economy are middle strata, and upper strata aristocrats aren't always particularly wealthy. Their income originates from exploiting the peasantry on subsistence farms. Since the middle strata is already wealthy enough to demand transportation, construction of railways in this state is likely to be both profitable and beneficial for population growth and general happiness because it rises the standard of living. With that, the net, net birth rate goes up and the general happiness, aka loyalty, also goes upwards. So you can see here, some are struggling. At least they're not starving, right? 7.6. Mostly of the peasants, but some are middling and some are secure. So that's that's quite okay for them. Starting to get okay. Standard of living factors affecting the middle strata in the state. Transportation is expensive. On average, 9% of pop expenditures. 
but they will use it. As a result, Pops in Victoria 3 won't always strive to ascend to a higher social strata, nor will an aristocrat always have a higher income or goods consumption needs compared to a clerk. All of this is driven by market forces. A qualifying clerk would gladly become an aristocrat on available land if that comes with a higher income than remaining a clerk. And this increased income will gradually result in an increase in their wealth and consumption demand. Conversely, the aristocrats don't demote to laborers because they can't acquire enough goods to sustain their lifestyle. They would only turn to such desperate measures if they become landless and unemployed and are trying to avoid starvation or if by some miracle taking on a relatively well-paid laborer job in a particularly profitable factory that would actually yield a greater paycheck than fa their failing farm provides them with. In practice, this means that it's important in both games to secure your population's basic needs to prevent starvation and also descend, followed by appeasing their desire for ever more advanced or exotic goods in larger and larger quantities to increase the size of your economy and power on the world stage. So this means diversification or trade or colonization. But while reaching this commonly pursued end goal in Victoria 2 often meant pursuing a certain optimal population distribution, no matter what else happened throughout the game, the professions of the pops you end up with could be vastly different between games in Victoria 3. If you build a colonial plantation economy, your aristocrats might remain as dominant by endgame as they were at the start. If you're, on the other hand, a manufacturing powerhouse on the cutting edge of technological progress, your middle strata pops might come to rival the capitalist class in wealth and power. If your high taxes are reinvested in vast institutions, your power buyers might be dominated by bureaucrats and academics. If your workers own the means of production, your laborers might even be wealthier and consume more luxuries than your neighbor's aristocrats. Everything logic and everything something to look forward to, how this dynamic leads us forward. These possibilities for diverse pop distributions also result in very different political tendencies in the population which lead to demand for different kinds of laws. In Victoria 2, it's primarily, primarily the rising consciousness of a greater ratio of more advanced and literate types of pops that drives the desire for reform in a liberal direction. In Victoria 3, uh, the more open-ended consumption model and the diversity of professions it can create could result in your population having very different political desires by endgame depending on the path you've taken. This requires the political machinery to be working in tandem with the economic engine, both to create the right conditions for your pops and to satisfy their changing desires. <coughs> I'm sorry. And these changing desires and loyalty and everything will be introduced in the next week's Dev Diary. Political movements. So thank you for watching, happy gaming to you. This is Manuel Khan signing out, see you soon and happy gaming.